Here's the question that I want to ask you. What happens the moment that our guilt is exposed? What happens the moment that your guilt and my guilt is exposed? The moment where you come home late and your parents have the stuff on the table. And they found it in your room, so it's nobody else's. It's yours. You know it's yours. They know it's yours. Everybody knows it's yours. And you're found guilty. One more time. And you're found guilty. Or what about the moments where you're married, you go out with the boys, or you go out with the girls for a night out, and you forget to come home? What do we do when we are found in a moment where we know that we are guilty? I'll tell you. Maybe you never thought about it this way. Maybe you don't think about it this way. Maybe the terminology or the vocabulary that you are thinking of isn't the one that I'm about to announce to you. But essentially, once you understand the word that I'm about to give you, you're going to end up agreeing with me that it is true. Here is what we want the moment that our guilt is exposed. It's one word, it starts with G, ends with E. It is grace. What is grace? Grace is someone extending to you what you know you don't deserve. Grace is when someone offers to you something that you cannot work for because you know that you are guilty. That was a B for participation. I want you to have an A plus, okay? Once you know that you don't deserve grace, then you can receive grace. And the moment that you get caught, and the moment that you get guilty, you are caught and you know that you're guilty, the one thing that you're hoping for is for someone to extend to you what you know you don't deserve. So let me give you another example. Maybe when you were younger, because I don't think that any of us would do this now, you probably snuck out of your house. And when you snuck out of your house, you took your parents' car. And then all of a sudden, you're driving out with your friends, maybe your girlfriend or your boyfriend, and then you get a phone call and it's mom's cell. <laughs> or it's dad's cell. And you pick up and then you know that you're guilty. So on your way to home, on your way back home, you're rushing because you know that you're guilty and you crash your parents' car. When you're walking into your home in those moments, you are hoping... <laughs> you are hoping that your parents will extend to you something that you don't deserve. And whenever you get something that you don't deserve extended to you, that is called grace. We all crave grace. We just never really thought about it that way. We just never really think about it that way. We never really actually word it that way. But the truth is this, that every time that your guilt is exposed, the one thing that you desire, the one thing that we are hoping for as human beings is this. We want grace for someone or people to extend to us what we know we do not deserve. Now, Jesus is all about grace. But there's this one disciple of Jesus called John. He was the last one to die out of the 12, and he died really old. And I can imagine a lot of the people, because they knew who he was, they probably were like, hey, we want to hear the stories about you and Jesus. We want to hear about all the miracles that you saw. And so I'm wondering if John at an old age decided to just write a document that explained the whole life of Jesus. And we obviously know that we have Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. He wasn't too creative with the titles, but whatever, the Gospel of John worked. And he created this document called the Gospel of John where we see who Jesus is, and his life, and his miracles. And then what amazes me is his epic introduction about Jesus. Because I wonder if he was trying to write things down, or maybe he had a scribe writing things down for him. I'm wondering how he must have thought, and how he must have processed, how do I start this epic story? And then he remembers, ah, I don't know how to start it. I don't know how I'm going to pen this, or have this penned. But I'm going to pray for God to give me the Holy Spirit's anointing to help me pen something that just becomes an epic introduction to who this man who lived, died, resurrected, and came back to life. I'm, I'm gonna, I want to start this introduction and I want to grasp people's attentions. And that's exactly what he did. John chapter 1 verse 14. And he starts, he says, the word became flesh and made his dwelling 
among us. He's like, I know it sounds weird. I know it sounds weird, but there's just no way that I could describe this Jesus. I just, I could, I could only describe him as the word. The word became flesh and he made his dwelling among us. And then he says, we have seen his glory. And by we, he's not talking about me or you or us we. By we, he's talking about him, John, Peter. He's talking about James. He's talking about the people that actually saw him both before he died and after he died. And he says, we have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only son. And then he finishes his introduction with something so truthful to our conversation. And he says this, who came from the father, full of grace and not the balance of grace and truth. 100% grace, 100% truth. Here's the problem, okay? Anytime that we try to balance grace and truth, we will either lose some grace or we will lose some truth. And I know that some of you grew up in a church where it was fully grace. All grace. You were in the side of the spectrum where it was all grace. Meaning, live liberally. Live the way that you want to live. And no matter what you do, God is okay with it. Come on, it's God's grace. And so we lived in ways that really never honored God. But I believe those are few. I believe that the majority of us possibly grew up in churches where they were full of truth and no grace. These were the legalistic churches that maybe some of us or some of you grew up in, where if you don't do this, you're going to go burn in hell. So if you sleep and you sinned before you fell asleep, you're waking up in hell tomorrow. This is a type of church where it would actually stand here and preach to you, turn or burn. And it would have those signs in the bumpers of their cars. How encouraging. I personally grew up in a church like that. And it was all about truth, but no grace. It was all about, hey, I'm going to tell it how it is because this is how it is. And so you better like it. If you don't like me, I don't care. I'm going to tell it how it is. Mm -hmm. And how pathetic, because that side of the spectrum <clears throat> is nothing like the original version of Christianity. See, the original version of Christianity was so attractive, it was magnetic. It was so attractive and magnetic that people who were not like Jesus liked Jesus. People were just coming. As a matter of fact, somewhere in the Gospels, chapter 16, verse 16, somewhere, it says that people were just leaning in because the grace of God, it was just something so different than what they had heard. It was something so different than what they had grown up with. It was so different than what they were used to. See, when, when you are either on one side of the spectrum, specifically the truth spectrum, it will turn you off from God. This is why some of you have possibly walked away from your faith. This is why some of you are so possibly turned off by church, faith, or God. And it's because you grew up in a version that was not the original version. Because the original version of Christianity, it was magnetic. It pulled you in. It made you want to get close to Jesus. It made you want to get invited to church. Nowadays, when you get a message from a Christian person, you just want to leave them on scene mode. Amen. <laughs> and, and, and maybe like in the early 2000s, they could bribe you with food after church. Now, that doesn't even work. <laughs> so I don't know where you stand, and I don't know where you grew up. I don't know if some of you are still in your faith, wrestling with your faith, or considering walking away from your faith. Or maybe you have walked away. But I want you to reconsider through this conversation that we're about to have right now. I want to give you three examples. Three examples where we see grace be displayed. The first one is with a character in the Bible called the chief tax collector. Now, I have your attention, don't I? <laughs> the chief tax collector, who is him? He is this short little guy called Zacchaeus. And Zacchaeus was a very rich man, but he got rich off the back of his own people. See, when the Roman Empire came and subdued the nation of Israel, the Roman Empire made Israel pay them taxes. But what was so interesting and so mean, clever, but really mean, was that the Roman Empire, the Roman Empire actually hired Jewish people, people from Israel, to tax their own people. That's so bad. They were turning them against them. 
Now, because we're sinful and we're greedy naturally and we're selfish, here's what these tax collectors would do. They would charge extra and more than what they were instructed to so that they could keep the change and they can give what was to Caesar what belonged to Caesar, the Roman emperor. You understand? And what ended up happening was these tax collectors built little pyramid schemes where a tax collector was getting a lot of money, so he needed more hands, so he would hire people to go and charge and collect the taxes. And so Zacchaeus was a guy that was at the top of the pyramid scheme. He had people working for him. And everybody in Israel hated Zacchaeus. He was a bad man. He was rich, he was wealthy, he was feared, but not for the right reasons. He was feared because he was a powerful man because the Roman Empire backed him up. But he turned his back on his own people. And so tax collectors were so sinful that when you read the Gospels, there are sinners on their category of their own and there are tax collectors. They were despised. They were not liked. And so one day Jesus has already been performing miracles and he's walking around with an entourage of people and people are following him because they want to get fed. That's what Jesus does. He meets needs. And they're walking around and everybody, you know, loves Jesus because he's like a celebrity during his day on earth. People had signs and people were just like following him from town to town and he had a multitude of people following him. And then one day Jesus decides to actually bump into this guy called Zacchaeus. Now Zacchaeus had no clue that he was just about to encounter life called Jesus. And Jesus is walking and he's making his way to a certain town. But on his way, he stops to meet Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus was so short that he climbed a tree in order to see just to get a small glimpse because Jesus was this famous. So this Zacchaeus guy, even though he was despised and he was hated, he wanted to see a small glimpse of Jesus. I'm wondering how many of you are actually hungry to see a small glimpse of Jesus? Will you climb the tree just to get a small glimpse of him? Will you make it to church? I mean, for some of us, climbing the tree means getting out of bed. To make it to church on Sunday. And our church starts like at, like at 6 p.m. If you're still in bed then, come on. You need a bigger miracle than Zacchaeus. And so here's what the Bible tells us. It tells us that Jesus stops and calls Zacchaeus by name. This was the most unexpected thing ever. And Jesus says, Zacchaeus, I'm coming to your house. And the crowd goes wild. <laughs> what? You're going to go to Zacchaeus' house? And not only that, but Jesus says, I'm going to go there and stay there for dinner. What? You're not, because back then religious law told you that you were not allowed to sit with sinners. You were not allowed to go to the house of a sinner. You, you're not even allowed to eat with sinners. And Jesus is saying, I'm going to go to your house. I'm going to stay there. I'm going to sit with you at your table. And I'm going to have dinner with you. And the crowd goes wild because they were not expecting Jesus. Such a good rabbi. A good, righteous, holy figure that promises life and draws you close to God. They never pictured that this good person would come into the house of such a bad person. My gosh. The crowd gets angry. Now Jesus goes into his house and the crowd must have been murmuring. Why would he be caught? I wouldn't even be caught dead inside Zacchaeus' house. And I feel like so many people got let down that they probably threw their poster signs of Jesus down on the floor. Angry that Jesus would actually accompany a man that was so rich so mean and rich off the backs of their own people. He was a traitor. Why would Jesus go to a traitor? Because that's what grace does. Grace meets you where you're at. Grace doesn't tell you you got to climb the mountain. Grace tells you I'm going to walk down the mountain. Because it's a good thing. It's a good thing. And then the Bible says that Zacchaeus, who knows what they spoke about, but says, this man changed my life. He gave back and returned to everything that he had, everything that he took, and he started following Jesus. So Jesus goes to the most unlikely. He goes to the most evil type of people. I'm wondering how many of you in here, you're wealthy. 
And do you feel like God would never go to you because maybe you've done too much evil in your life? Well, I'm telling you here today, if Jesus visited Zacchaeus, Jesus wants to visit you too. The next example of grace is this character called the woman caught in adultery. And here's what happened. The religious leaders hated Jesus because he came to flip everything upside down for them. The religious leaders were so zealous and they were jealous and they wanted you to have a hard life in order to earn your way to God. And Jesus was like, no, that's not how it's going to get done anymore. Um, you don't have to follow all the rules because I'm going to come and fulfill them for you. But they wanted to trap him because it would go against everything that they were taught and everything that they were teaching. And so one day they waited because they saw a scenario where a woman was caught in adultery. She was having um, intimate, intimacy with another person's husband. And they throw the woman at him. And he said, hey, this woman was caught in adultery. The law says that we have the right to kill her and stone her because she's dirty. She's filthy. She has a bad past. She does bad things. She's immoral. She's had too many partners in life. The law gives us the right to stone her. Jesus, what do you say we do? And Jesus was so boss. He just stoops down, kneels on the ground, and writes on the sand. I'm guessing he must have written something like this. It takes one to know one. <laughs> then Jesus says something very powerful. He says, any of you who has not sinned, and has no sin, throw the first stone. And all the old men were like, ah, oh, shoot. And the young guys were like, we're ready. The old men were like, shut up, stupid, come, let's go. <laughs> Literally says that the old men actually refused and they walked away first. They probably, why? Because I think that the older we get, the more we realize how broken we really are. Yeah. See, the younger you are, the more unself-aware you are. And the older you get, the more you end up realizing that you're not that great. And all the older people said, and all the young people are like, uh, but I thought I was cute. <laughs> you're cute, yeah, amen. And one by one, every single person started walking away from Jesus. Look what the Bible says. Then Jesus stood up again and said to the woman, where are your accusers? Didn't even one of them condemn you? No, Lord, she says. No, Lord. And it's a beautiful Pixar moment, y'all. The sun is setting, the sky's orange. It's just an amazing moment. And then Jesus comes and he ruins the Pixar moment. And I'll tell you with how. He ruins it with truth and grace. Truth and grace. And he stoops down to her. And he says, neither do I. But go and sin no more. Truth and grace. Grace. All grace. Would possibly say, oh, I know you've had a tough life. I get your emotions. I know that you had maybe some issues at home that led you to certain decisions that are bad and now you're in a place that you don't really want to be in but you're there. See, that's what grace, only grace would say. Grace is the understanding but when we lean too much towards grace, we, we, we end up leaving out truth. So Jesus did give her grace and he says, these people couldn't condemn you. Neither do I condemn you. This moment must have been like, but I'm, but I'm guilty. And Jesus says, I know. She's like, wait, 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 wait. I've never been treated like this ever in my entire life. I don't even know how to receive grace. You know, a lot of us don't even know how to receive grace. We can pray for grace for others, but we don't know how to receive it for ourselves. When other people mess up, you're like, hey man, don't worry, we got you. We're going to pray for you. But when then you mess up, you start condemning yourself and you don't want to get up and you want to walk because you think that you're more filthier than others and you think that God's grace can't cover you because you think that his grace is smaller than your sin. But God's grace is bigger than all of your sins put together. Come on, clap your hands, all ye people from the back. If you know that God's grace is good. He says, no, neither do I. You're guilty. I don't condemn you. But, but, 
go and sin no more. A lot of us like to part where it says, but go and sin, period. You come to church, you receive God's grace. <laughs> You're like, oh Lord, help me with this sin. Amen. All right. Got convicted. Now I can go back to sin all the more. But Jesus, it says, he's saying to you, I know that you're guilty. But go and sin no more. Look, there are so many of you in here that you feel so, maybe filthy, dirty, ashamed. Maybe not by what you did. Maybe by what was done to you. Or maybe with, you're ashamed of the things that you keep wrestling with that you don't want to keep doing, but you end up doing anyway. You're caught in a cycle. And it's tough to think that God can love you that way. And you must ask yourself in those moments where you spiral back down all over again, how could God, who has given me so much mercy, still keep on giving me mercy even now? But look at me. That's what grace is. Grace is when someone extends to you what you know that you don't deserve. The moment that you think that you earned God's grace, the moment that you think that you worked for it and earned it, is, that's a, and, and, and you think that you have God's grace because of your good behavior, that's exactly the same as you trying to plan your own surprise party. <laughs> Planning your surprise party voids the surprise. Earning God's grace voids the grace. So aren't you glad? Aren't you glad? Aren't you glad that I don't have to work for it? I don't have to earn it. I don't have to. God gives it to me for free. I don't deserve it. I can never earn it. But God, <laughs> he's so good. He gives you grace for free. Go into no more. The third person. This is the last person we're talking about tonight. And this is the one person that I feel like God pressed in my heart to speak to you. I feel like God has something to say to some people here today. The third person is the criminal on the cross. I believe that the criminal on the cross is the greatest display of God's grace. Luke chapter 23, verse 33 says this. When they came to the place called the skull, they crucified Jesus there, along with criminals, one on his right and the other on his left. One of the criminals who hung there hurled insult at Jesus. Aren't you the Messiah? Save yourself and save us too. What audacity. But the other criminal rebuked him. Don't you fear God, he said, since you are under the same sentence? We are punished justly for we are getting what our deeds, say that word with me, deserve. But this man has nothing wrong. See, this man knew that he was guilty. And he was pretty much saying something. Saying, if the kingdom of heaven has to do with you being righteous, with behaving well, with getting your church heart spiritually right. If the kingdom of heaven has to do with me being a perfect person and getting it all right and not messing up ever again, here's what this criminal was basically saying. And if that's what the kingdom of heaven is like, then we are hopeless. We are hopeless. You will never be good enough because God's good enough is perfection. And that's why Jesus came to die because he knew that you would never be able to reach perfection. And some of you forgot the epicenter of Christianity is grace. And that's why you have turned and you've walked away because you know that you can't measure up to what religion and the law demands. But God is saying to you, hey, I died on the cross 
because I knew you never would. But I know that I could. And Jesus substituted you and he substituted me. And in a beautiful exchange, he took all your weaknesses, he took all your mistakes, he took all your flaws, all your letdowns, he took it all and he exchanged it through grace. And he gave you mercy. That's how good he is. Then he said, this is, this is the sinner, the criminal. Jesus, and remember that they're crucified, so it takes a lot of energy to speak when you're crucified. You have to prop yourself up in order to speak, and it hurts to speak because crucifixion is death by asphyxiation. Then he said, Jesus, remember me. When you come into your kingdom. Can you imagine what the crowd was thinking in this moment? <laughs> Remember that Jesus got crucified and there's a crowd down there. John is watching all this because he was the only one that never deserved Jesus on the cross. Here's what the crowd must have been thinking. Maybe they were thinking what you've been told. Here's what the crowd must have been thinking. Why would he, this criminal, ask Jesus to save him? He doesn't have time. There was no more time for restitution. There was no more time to make things up. There was no time to fix all the bad. See, this guy that was a criminal on the cross, listen to me, this guy, he, he had never done anything right in his life. He had never gotten anything right. He had never done good. He lived a whole life of evil, of bad, of wrong. He never extended to anybody what grace was extending to the world. And the crowd must have been like, you can't even climb down that cross and get baptized. Because a lot of us think that if we're baptized, we made it. No, baptism is a good thing. But getting wet by holy man doesn't mean salvation. Salvation comes from Jesus. Say it again. Salvation comes from Jesus. So the only one that can save you is Jesus, not the baptism. Or seven Hail Marys. Or 10 for 10th year. The only one that can save you is? Jesus. So I can imagine the crowd being bothered. Who does this guy think he is? Asking God, asking Jesus to save him. This criminal had absolutely no bargaining power. This criminal, and this is the sentence that I feel like God wanted me to give to you. And I feel, and I pray that I can deliver to you the way he made me feel it. This criminal had nothing to offer. And I'm wondering how many of you in here, you don't draw close to God because you feel like you have nothing to offer him. You feel like your life has been a wreck. You feel like you've done too many mistakes. You feel like God must be mad at you, angry with you, and you're standing in a place where you want God you want to get close, but you don't deem yourself worthy enough. And you're in a place where you feel like you have nothing to offer. You know, I've heard some people say, I can't even hang out with church people because I'm not good enough. I've heard some people go, when you invite them to church, hey, you want to come to church? And they go, ha, me? In church? No, man. The holy, wall, the holy water will evaporate the moment I come into the building. I've, 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 I've seen some young women in the past 10 years feeling like they're unworthy because of all the bad things they've done, all the bad things that have been done. And I feel like some people sometimes sit, and maybe this might be you today, and you're sitting in a place where you're going, but I have nothing to offer God. <laughs> See, that's the point of grace. Grace point of grace is you're not supposed to you're supposed to come empty handed you're supposed to come empty handed not with moralistic behavior and I'm not saying that bad behavior, evil behavior, lustful behavior you know, evil, mean I'm not saying those things are good but what I'm trying to say is this, that it does not start there it starts with Jesus showing you and extending to you something you don't 
deserve. Someone say, praise God. And the Bible says that Jesus answered him. See? Does, does God hear the prayers of sinners and imperfect people? Yeah. Because grace always has an answer. Some of you, you're in a place where you don't feel like you have nothing to offer God and that's why you're in a place where you feel like you can't even pray to him. But this man had nothing to offer, had no bargaining power. He had no opportunity, had no more time left to fix all his wrongs, to dot all his I's and cross his T's. He had no more time. But the Bible says that Jesus answered because grace always has an answer. In spite of who you are, in spite of all that you are, in spite of what you've done, and watch this, in spite of all that you might even do, God saw your sin, past, present, future, and he said, I still choose you. I still will die for you. Paul, the Apostle Paul, a very predominant figure. The Bible says that even when I was still a sinner, Christ chose to die for me, even when I still was a sinner. And Jesus answered him and said, truly I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. That's so good. Because he didn't deserve it. He didn't deserve it. So I'm guessing that some of you in here might be like, well, doesn't God care about justice? Now that we're in an era where our generation is really into justice. <laughs> well, doesn't God care about justice and consequences? Well, I'm going to read to you what I wrote. The truth is that he actually does. He understands it all fairly well. And because he understood it, this is why Jesus came to die. Because Jesus knew God's justice would crush us. God's justice would crush you because the word says that we've all, all have sinned. As a matter of fact, here's the thing, here's the truth. Not only, does not only did Jesus know that God's justice would crush you, he also knew that your own sin would crush you because every sin is prepackaged with a gotcha. Let me prove that to you. Think about all your regrets. Oh, no, 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 nobody, nobody has any. Okay, think about all your ex-boyfriends and girlfriends. Your ex-wife, your ex-husband. Oh, man, I shouldn't have gone there. Think about all the dumb decisions you took. All the people that you allowed to slide into your DMs and responded. For adults, think about the places and the things that you bought and purchased when you knew you had the money to not afford it. Regret. You bought a car to impress people who don't even care about you. Then you got in debt. Now you're struggling. Now you're in trouble. You became close with people that you knew you should not be close to. You got into a circle that you were not supposed to be in. You didn't switch the circle when Pastor Marlon preached a couple of weeks ago. That's that switch your circle. And now you're in a place. <laughs> Were your regrets? Your regrets cut up. Your consequences cut up. See, all sin is prepackaged with a gotcha. And that's why Jesus came in his love, mercy, and grace to get you. Because he loves you. He knew that the weight of your own sin would be too much for you to repay God with. The truth is that all of you are sinners, including me. And I don't know what the problem is with so many people trying to make pastors like be God. Stop, sell, st 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 stop worshiping pastors. Like I'm a human exactly like, listen, did you know that I actually 
have weaknesses. I mess up. Sometimes I mess up really small. Sometimes I mess up really big. Because we're all sinners. You are a sinner. That's why it's pointless for us all being sinners pointing at each other's sins. The only one that should point at your sin and mine is Jesus. But even then, even though he has the power to point at your sin and my sin, he still chooses not to. That's how good our God is. The psalmist wrote that God, he wiped a record clean. So, I don't really know why people wouldn't want grace to be true. Like, look, 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 I can settle. Like, we can settle. Like, honestly, I can settle with you not believing that it's true. And maybe you don't believe that it's true because maybe you just need some more information or maybe you need some more time. Maybe you need to reconsider some things and really listen to yeah, a pastor or, 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 or this sermon all over again and just reconsider. Maybe you need more information to believe that's true. But, but, but I'm not even really going after you believing that it's true. I just don't understand why we wouldn't want Christianity to be true. I, I believe that we all desire and I proved it to you earlier in this message. We all desire what Jesus has to offer. So I don't know where you've been. I don't know where you're at. But I pray in Jesus' name that if God is tugging at your heart today, that you may consider following him. Jesus, not a pastor. Because some of you follow Jesus, but you're really following a human being. And so when a human being messes up, you're like, I'm done with church. Yeah, that's the problem. You follow the church without following Jesus. And I'm not here to bug anybody. I'm not here to bully you. I'm not here to like, you know, bring you down. No, no, no. I know there's church hurt. But if, if we profess to believe in Jesus and we believe in what he says and we know that he is healer and we know that he is forgiver and we know that he is redeemer, why, why, why don't we live by the principles that we profess, that we say that we follow him for? See, I'm going to say one last thing before we close this moment and get into worship. There's, there's a disturbance to grace. There's a disturbance to grace because grace has a tension. Grace has a tension. We all love grace when it is extended to us, but we completely become disturbed the moment that grace must be extended to those that hurt us. There's a tension. We love it when it is given to us, but we hate it when we have to extend it to a brother or a sister, especially when they hurt those you love. Yeah? But that's what grace is. I extend what I know you don't deserve because Jesus extended to me what I know because I know who I am. You know who you are. Yet he extended grace to me anyway. Amen. Yeah, that's a good place to clap. Praise the Lord.